Hello, and welcome to the lecture for separation techniques. In this lecture, we're going to be covering two main topics. We're going to be covering physical properties, and, and those are properties that an object maintains um, throughout that object that you can measure without doing any sort of chemical change to it, and also how we can separate things out using those physical properties. And with these physical properties, we're going to be focusing on three main types. The first is going to be solubility. The second is going to be the melting and freezing points, or it's also going to be the condensation or evaporation points. We're going to be concerned with size, how we separate things based off of size. And the last one is going to be density, or how heavy something is compared to the size that it is. And all of these are things that are fairly easy for us to separate out. And we do this type of separation quite frequently, as we'll end up seeing here. So the first thing that we're going to do is look at solubility. And solubility is going to be a physical property that determines whether or not a compound can be dissolved. And it can be either dissolved in either polar or nonpolar solvents. In general, when we talk about something being soluble, we're usually talking about whether or not it can dissolve in water. And different things you already know can be dissolved in water. For instance, salt is easily dissolved in water and Sugar is also easily dissolved in water. You can both dissolve those in water without having any big issues. Some things that are not soluble in water are going to be oil or fats usually are not soluble in water. Those are nonpolar substances. So those things are going to be hard to dissolve in water. And if you were to go ahead and separate, you know, fat from water, that would be an example of you using solubility to go ahead and make that happen. So the solubility does have some separation techniques for it. And there are two big separation techniques that we can use. The first being decanting. And the idea behind decanting is that you end up having your liquid and then you have a solid. So if your solid is more dense than your liquid, then your liquid's going to stay on top of your solid. And if you pour that off, so if you just pour off that top liquid, that process is then called decanting. The other thing that you can do is using filtration. And filtration is going to be very similar to decanting. It's just that you end up having a filter here. And the solid that is undissolved, or the substance that is not dissolved in the water, and usually it is a solid, will get caught up by the filter. And then the water or whatever liquid that you're using to separate this out will end up flowing through and into the bottom of your container. And this is something that you have probably seen often when you make coffee. Coffee uses a filtration technique to go ahead and make sure that all those solids don't get into the coffee cup because, you know, you don't want to chew on your coffee. Well, some people may not want to chew on their coffee. Okay, so that's the separation techniques that use solubility. Next, we're going to go ahead and talk about the melting and freezing points, or melting and evaporation points. So, any phase change points are going to end up being a physical property. So, the point at which a substance changes its physical state, going from a solid to a liquid, or from a liquid to a solid, is going to be an example of a physical property. And we can use the fact that different substances have different melting and boiling points to separate them out. Because you can imagine that if an oil requires a negative 32 degrees in order to freeze, 
and you have it on top of water, you can go ahead and put that in the fridge or in the freezer, get it to zero degrees, all of your water will freeze and then your oil will still be sitting right on top there. And that's the idea behind using melting and evaporation points to uh, separate out different compounds. Now, we already talked about decanting and an obvious set if you're using water and oil would be to decant that out and go that way. But we're also going to talk about distillation. And distillation is going to use the evaporation or condensation point to go ahead and help us separate out different compounds. So we all know that water boils at 100 degrees. And this is useful because we can heat different objects to less than 100 degrees if they're mixed with water. And if those objects evaporate at less than 100 degrees, we'll be able to separate them out. Now, the process that uses this is called distillation. And it uses the difference between different boiling points to separate out different compounds. So, typically, what will happen, and this is more often done with different types of alcohols, that's the most common use for distillation is that you will have some sort of substance that is mixed and it has both water and alcohol in a container. Water we know boils at a hundred degrees. Most alcohols will boil around 70 degrees. So alcohols are going to turn into a gas at about 70 degrees. So that means that you can go ahead and heat your container right here to about 70 degrees and what will happen is that alcohol is going to turn into a gas and then it'll end up going into this tube right here because the gas expands and wants to try and get everywhere. So the alcohol expands, it goes into this tube and then it ends up condensing down because you can imagine this tube is no longer 70 degrees. This tube is sitting at room temperature which is closer to 25 degrees. Okay, and by using the fact that we have that different boiling point, the water will stay behind and the alcohol will end up concentrating over here. And that's what's often going on in distilleries that end up making alcohol. And the real key here is that this is just a way to separate out different compounds based off of their boiling point. Now, it isn't just used for alcohol. There are other things that end up using distillation. And one of the big things that we use it for is separating out the different compounds that are within oil. And the idea behind this is that when you get a large barrel of oil, you're actually going to have a lot of different compounds in there. You're going to have kerosene and gasoline, and you're going to have uh, large molecules that are like the precursors for asphalt. And you're going to have methane, and you have all of these different things that are in there. And so what you could do is you could make a really large column that'll have a whole bunch of different temperatures in it, and all of those different compounds will end up boiling off at those different temperatures and you can separate them out. Now this is an example of a distillation column and what you'll notice here is that you have your higher temperatures here. You will end up putting in your crude oil and everything is going to go ahead and heat up and your um, heavier objects are going to end up getting pulled out right from the beginning because that's where they're going to get pulled out. Your lighter objects will end up getting pulled out right up here. Okay, So your small molecules are going to have a very low boiling point and they're going to get pulled out at the top of the refinery. They require less heat than the things that are at the bottom. 
these things like lubricating oil, the oil that is required to uh, lubricate your engine, are things that require a lot of heat to go ahead and turn them into a gas. So it will take a while for those to go ahead and reach their normal boiling point. And this is what goes on with fractional distillation. The idea is that there are different boiling points. So this is probably set to about, you know, 100 or uh, less than 60 degrees right here. So that only petrol comes out. This one is set between 60 and 100 degrees so that only the naphtha comes out. Okay. And that's the idea of fractional distillation. There are certain areas of the country that do a lot more kind of a lot more volume of fractional distillation than others. And while we're here and talking about it, we should go ahead and talk about what it ends up looking like. Now, often these large columns are fractional distillation areas. And one thing that should be noted about fractional distillation is that areas that have a lot of plants that have it typically have a lot worse air quality. Because if you can imagine, a lot of these compounds that are up here are small enough that they might actually escape into the environment. And unfortunately, in areas that have a lot of these refineries, there is a much higher incidence of cancer. And one of the areas of the country that is really getting hit hard with these cancer areas is uh, these areas that are in dark red in this map of Louisiana. Now these areas that are in dark red in Louisiana are, are where a lot of these refineries are. And while we are talking about the presence of these refineries, we need to also go ahead and talk about the population that is there. <clears throat> a lot of the population that lives in these areas that has a higher amount of cancer ends up being so a lot of the people that are in these areas that are in cancer alley end up being people that are on the poorer end of the spectrum and a lot of these refineries were actually placed near what were traditionally uh, black neighborhoods. And this decision was often made without any input of any of the people that were living near these areas. And a lot of times these areas were built right across the, the street from these traditional black neighborhoods without any input from any of the residents. And often if there was input from the residents, it was extremely negative and asking them not to be put in. So this is just one example of how an industry could go ahead and input in a, uh, in this case, a chemical plant without any input from the people that actually are going to be most affected by it. And unfortunately, as you can see, the rates of cancer do increase when there are more of these fractional distillation plants. All right, we have to get back here. All right, the next thing that we can go ahead and use to modify or separate things out is by size, okay? And we can use size to go ahead and filter out both non-living and living matter. One of the common ways is to use a slotted pan, which has been used before. And often in industry, we will also use um, just slots that go for a certain size of an object. Okay. This is something, you know, if it's small enough, it's going to go ahead and go through there. If it's not, it's going to continue on down that line until it gets to a slot that it can fit into. 
And this is something that a lot of us are very, very familiar with. It should be easy to separate things out by size. Next, we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, a little bit about biology and how different materials can be filtered out. And we're talking about this in particular because of some of the issues that happened with mass in the last pandemic that we had. So a lot of people ended up saying that their reasons for not being able to wear a mask was because it would end up inhibiting their idea, their ability to breathe because they would not be able to get enough oxygen. Where what we can go ahead and do is that we can take a look at the size difference between molecules that have oxygen in it and the size of molecules of the virus. Now typically cotton fiber is able to do a pretty good job of trapping molecules that are about this size. Okay, So this is 100 nanometers in size. Notice that it ends up being about 10 to the third as small as water. Okay, So if something's good at capturing this, it's not going to be very good at capturing this. And the reason is, is that that water or uh, oxygen molecules are going to be so much smaller than a virus is. In fact, this is about a thousand times smaller than a virus. To go ahead and compare that to something else, a flea is going to be a thousand times smaller than a hobbit. Okay. So the people that were saying oh that i can't breathe with this mask on we're essentially comparing the size of a flea to a hobbit and saying oh okay well this spider web or whatever that you could use to go ahead and capture a hobbit is not going to allow a flea to get through when realistically we know that the size difference between a flea that's going to be able to navigate anything that could capture a hobbit a lot more easily than the hobbit the main point of being able to talk about this is that often smaller molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen are not going to be able to be filtered out through a mask because a mask is just going to be able to filter out larger molecules and the virus is going to not be filtered is going to be filtered by the mask whereas oxygen will not which is why wearing a mask does not impede your breathing quite as much as a lot of people like to pretend that it does. Okay, and now we're going to go ahead and go over the last one, which is going to be density. And density is going to be a another physical property it's how heavy something is compared to how much volume it takes up everything has a different density uh, gold is known for having a particularly high density and if it's something where the two products don't end up mixing very well you can continue to use objects like decanting or filtration and earlier with the decanting image we showed that you know, the solid had a bigger density than the liquid, and it's easy to go ahead and decant it out. With products that are miscable, which means that they can easily be mixed, we're going to have to use another, or we're going to have to use some motion in order to get that to separate out. And there's two big ways that we go, can go ahead and do it. The first is through... Uh, centrifuge and the idea of a centrifuge is that it's going to go ahead and take whatever sample that you're using and it's going to spin it very vigorously and when it does that the compounds that are more dense are going to naturally end up settling down to the bottom of the vial that's holding that particular material this is how they end up separating out uh, 
plasma and red blood cells so that they spend it, send it through this centrifuge and it ends up separating out those materials. This is also how they end up separating out uh, different forms of uranium. And in the uh, early 2010s, there was a, a big deal with what's called the um, Iranian nuclear program. And the Iranian nuclear program was making a lot of enriched uranium. And as part of the deal to go ahead and remove some of the restrictions that were placed on Iran, we ended up removing a lot of their nuclear centrifuges, which stops them from enriching uranium. And the idea behind the enriching of the uranium is that there's two forms of uranium, and one is more dense and the one is less dense. And in general, if you're making nuclear fuel, you're looking for the less dense one. And they basically just move it through a pumping type of system where they're essentially trying to separate out the U-235 via this pump system and then moving it along and separating out the U-235 at the top and hoping to enrich it to a high percentage. That's really the goal that's going on with a nuclear centrifuge. And during the conflict, we ended up taking these away from Iran, which stopped them from being able to enrich their fuel to make a nuclear weapon. This is one of the things that, as I saw it as a chemist, I saw this as the obvious solution that we need to remove these in order to stop them from making super enriched fuel, whereas a lot of the um, other talk that was going on at the time was centered around, you know, getting rid of their program, all of their nuclear things altogether, making the assumption that they would not be able to uh, create a weapon if we removed all of it. And to be perfectly honest, I think that removing the centrifuges was a much better option long term for Iran. Especially since I believe that nuclear fuel does have a future in our, in at least the next hundred years of our economy. Okay. Now the last one is going to be with chromatography. And chromatography is really more about separating out different dyes. And it also uses movement and density. The idea is is that if a dye is soluble and most dyes are going to be soluble in something you can go ahead and combine them together with multiple dyes to get what color that you want but you can also separate them out and the process by which you separate them out is by taking your dye mixture you place it on a piece of paper and then you place it in some sort of liquid that's going to go ahead and move up the piece of paper. And your hope is that that liquid is going to go ahead and take the dye with it. Now that liquid, when it's all by itself, is going to move a lot faster than the dye will. And the idea is that the dye will go up the paper, but not nearly as much as the uh, liquid that it is dissolved in will. So we're going to show you a couple of pictures here. And this is an example of, oh, this is a terrible example, but this is an example of dyes being brought along. And what happens is that the liquid that was used for it went all the way up to here. When it reach die A, it was only able to pull it up to right here. Die B was able to get up here. Die C was able to get here. And die M was a combination of all three to make a different kind of color. 
And one of the things that we like to do with this type of separation is to quantify it by using what's known as the RF factor. And the RF factor is just going to be, all right, how far up did this die go divided by how much the total solvent went. Okay, and the, this is how we measure dyes, or in particular, how we measure chromatography. Okay. Now, often it'll end up looking slightly different. Sometimes you will see that when a dye ends up being uh, brought along, that some of it will be left behind, and then you'll have a second one, and then this will be your total thing. Later on, we are going to be doing a chromatography experiment, and we are going to end up making a setup that's like this. There are a couple of things to note on this particular type, that when you are doing this, you want to make sure that your filtrate, that your dye in particular, is above where the solvent line is, because you don't want it to accidentally get just dissolved into the solvent. And then you want to make sure that it's that you mark the origin line, which is where your dye ends there, okay? And the idea here is that these dyes are going to have different densities. The ones that have higher densities will end up staying behind, whereas the ones that have lower densities will end up moving forward, okay? This is going to end up closing us out for this particular lesson. A reminder that our separation techniques, or the physical properties that we use for our separation techniques, included solubility, our melting and evaporation points, size, and density.